Good morning. Welcome to To The Point. If you have been with us over the past several weeks, you know we've talked a lot about auto no-fault insurance reform. Well, this past week, the primary bill that we've been discussing was voted on in the House of Representatives and defeated. Why was it defeated? Well, that may be up for debate, but the mechanics of how it was defeated are pretty simple. Speaker of the House Tom Leonard supported the bill, as did the Democratic mayor of Detroit. But the speaker was very transparent when he said from the outset that he was going to need perhaps as many as 15 Democrats to go along with the Republicans that he could round up to support the plan. In the end, the Democrats weren't on board and the plan failed. So what happens next? There still is an appetite to talk about auto no-fault insurance reform, but will it really happen? On Thursday morning, before the vote was taken, I sat down with the supporter of the plan that ultimately failed. Representative Mary Whiteford from Allegan County talked to me about the complexity of the issue and why she thought it was so vitally important. Well, over about two years, I knocked on over 13,000 doors in Allegan County. The number one issue I heard over and over again was the high cost of auto insurance. And I kept hearing more and more about people who couldn't afford it and dropped their insurance. I heard from local state farm agents, local insurance agents who said, we have got to do something about this because people are coming to our offices and can't afford the insurance. So help us. So that's been one of my main priorities since I was elected almost two years ago is to do something about reforming auto insurance. Last spring, I was part of a bill package that reformed one side of it because there's basically three portions to auto insurance. There's the car damage, there's a catastrophic fund, but there's also something called the assigned claims. And that part addresses uninsured victims. So within that system, there is so much fraud and abuse as evidenced by, I know as of June, the number of applications in this year compared to last year to be able to get this benefit had doubled. You know there's not twice as many people who actually had accidents who were uninsured victims. The costs are increasing $10 million every year. So even that portion of our auto insurance we're working to try to reform, we could not get enough votes to do that. So I was so committed at that time. And so now we're trying to reform all of the rest of our auto no fault. And the biggest part is the catastrophic fund. So when somebody is catastrophically injured. All I know is we have got to have reforms. The number of cases going before trial courts. You know, the whole point of this no fault was to decrease the amount of cases going to court. So that's gone from about 15% to 40% of all cases going through courts right now are related to auto insurance. In some places, it's over 50%. Obviously, this whole no fault scenario is not pay playing along with the intent of the original legislation. So what do we do now? Number one, we need to make sure that people have a choice for what kind of coverage that they have for personal injury protection. Which is 45% or so of your overall premium, right? Yes. Okay. So it's a big amount. And we are the only state in the country that has unlimited benefits for your lifetime. This is a big expense. Not everybody needs coverage like that. And because we are the only state in the country that has that, we are the most expensive state in the country. So if that is one part that we need to fix. And just like when we go and purchase our health insurance, we have a choice for what kind of coverage we have. I know if I can afford this amount of money, that's what I'm going to pay for my insurance. That's a coverage, that's the benefits I'm gonna have. We don't give people that option. We just give them the platinum plan. You have no choice. And if you don't have this platinum plan, you are driving illegally. So number one, let's give people a choice. So now you have a choice of $250,000, which is still the highest in the nation, 500,000, or you can keep your unlimited benefits. People have that choice. What came out of the insurance company last, or the insurance committee last week, is that every single person in that plan will get a reduction of at least 10%. 10% reduction if you do have unlimited, 20% if you have $500,000 in coverage, and then you could have, you have a 40% decrease if you have the $250,000 coverage. So number one, have a choice. The other thing that's been happening in the 
The general example I give is an MRI. It can cost $500 to get an MRI if you have Medicaid. So that's what the hospital gets reimbursed for an MRI. Your insurance might reimburse at $1,000. There's been upwards of $3,000 that's been reimbursed by auto insurance victims who get an MRI because the law is reasonable and customary charges. You know, here's some people just took advantage of that. So we need to get it more along the lines of something that's unacceptable, something that covers their costs. And so right now we've got it at 100% of Medicaid reimbursement. I know there's some amendments out there to raise that up that I will definitely listen to. So, and then another part is reducing fraud. There's a lot of fraud going on, so we develop a fraud authority. We need to be able to get into the books and see exactly what is being charged, what kind of money is in that catastrophic fund, and that needs to be um, brought to the governor and to the health insurance committee. So things like that are put in there just to prevent fraud. And you know, I have to say one thing sure. is right now, hospitals and doctor's offices, they're saying, yeah, but this is helping us keep our bottom line up overall because our Medicaid reimbursement is so low where people can't afford their insurance. So we're making more money here to cover our losses. Well, what are we doing? So we're demanding that ratepayers are subsidizing health care. So when you think in terms of reforming auto no fault, yes. you have to think of the constituencies. Yes. And I assume as an elected representative, the first constituency are the people you represent in Allegan County. Yes. So you've got those folks who buy yeah. the auto insurance, but you also have the providers, the healthcare, the hospitals, yes. and all of the rehabilitation. So you've got that group. And then you've got another really powerful group in the insurance companies. Yeah. And right now, if you turn on your television, you see these two <laughs> entities yeah. clogging the airwaves, battling it out over this piece of legislation. Yeah but you don't see the folks in Allegan County running commercials saying no, we want our rates reduced or mm -hmm. we want this coverage. Yeah. How do you balance that as a, legislature, a legislator? Because um, there's a full court press on this bill. Yes, there is. And I see all of the operatives. I walked in yeah. today and you're just, they're just everywhere. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I know you see the same thing. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you deal with that? At this point in my life, I'm a mom, I'm a grandma, I've run businesses, I'm in my 50s. I've seen a lot. I worked in an emergency room. I took care of people, children dying. I mean, I've seen it all. I know that the bottom line is I have to answer to my faith, to my family, and the people I represent. That's it. And if I do that, I'm being a good legislator and I'm being a good Christian, but that's who I answer to. And I had a town hall about a month ago. The room was full. Every single person wanted reforms. I had two people who didn't, but when they asked their questions, Representative Tice, who's the chair of the committee, she was there. She gave answers, and these answers reinforced my belief in reforms, and it actually caused these people to change their minds and understand why it's so important. How convinced are you, how certain can you be that if this bill is presented past, mm -hmm. that the savings are real? Because to start with, some on the pro side will say, well, you're going to save 40%. Well, you'd save 40% of about 45% of the yeah. bill or about 20%, 18%, mm -hmm. whatever you're going to save. Savings nonetheless. Right. But how can you, as somebody who has to vote on it, how can I, as somebody who has to pay for it, be sure that those are real savings? Right. That's why that was put into the law, into the bill. It's not a law yet. But it was put into the bill to say, you guys have to do this no matter what. If we don't, the rates may be kept high with less benefits because that's just how people are sometimes, right? They don't do the right thing by people. So that's why we're putting that mandate in there for now for five years. Let's get it in there. Let's reevaluate. Let's give relief. One of the curiosities uh, as a reporter mm -hmm. in this town is that I've had this conversation with yeah dozens and dozens of office holders. I've never met anybody who doesn't want to in some way reform the auto no fault right. insurance here. But we've never been able 
to see it come to fruition with 55, 19, and 1, which is yeah. what you need. Is it because people fundamentally disagree, or is it because people can't come together on a plan? Right. I think people can't come together on a plan. And we have an insurance chair, Representative Tice, and I know she went through all the possibilities. Do we have a bunch of individual bills, or do we put it all in one? And she made that tactical decision to put all the changes into one bill. And let's see where it goes. I have to say, this is not going to be the end product. There's going to be some amendments on the floor today. When if, I'm hoping it makes it out of the House, and when it goes to the Senate, there will be some amendments there. There's more than likely it's going to come back to conference committee where we get to keep people at the table and make the final decisions. So that's what I think is going to happen. That's what I'm hoping. And to all of my colleagues' benefit, I don't see a single representative who doesn't follow their deeply held beliefs. I give credit to people for that. But I know me, myself, and what I hear from my constituents, this is the right decision for Allegheny County. Finally, no matter what happens, and by the time this airs, we'll know and I will explain what has happened, but the, the vote is a difficult one on either side because, as you say, it's not the final vote. Right. And what comes back from the Senate, depending on how they deal with this, mm -hmm. the Senate Majority Leader has had some pretty strong language yes. in regards particularly to the mandatory rollbacks. What comes back could be a bill, could have the same number on it, mm -hmm. and look Very unlike different. this, <laughs> and it, it might be something that you yeah. can't get back to 55. So, I mean, it's not the final vote, is it? Right. It is not. It is a work in progress. And I definitely learned that through the budget season. <laughs> As I said, that conversation with the representative happened on Thursday morning before the late night vote that defeated that bill. So what does happen next with auto no fault? There are a number of other pieces of legislation that have been introduced, though no hearings have been held. And there is still conversation going on in the Senate about what they might do with auto no fault insurance. But keep this in mind. There are only a handful of session days left in this year, perhaps about 12. And if something doesn't get done this year, getting a big piece of legislation like no-fault reform done in an election year next year could be even more difficult. When we come back, more to the point. Welcome back to To The Point. Well, there's more going on in Lansing than just that discussion about auto no-fault insurance. Last week, we sat down with Democratic Senator Stephen Bita to talk about some of his priorities, an attorney by trade. He's focusing on some criminal justice issues that he talked to us about. Senator, we are coming down to the end of the legislative year, and there's some big lift issues that are still around. We may get to some of those, but I wanted to talk to you specifically about something you've been working on about removing statute of limitations for particular offense and several different degrees. I want you to explain it because I think this is something people at home will be interested in. Yeah, it's uh, Senate Bill 52, uh, which I sponsored. And actually, last session, I had sponsored a similar bill. Uh, I had passed the Senate, and um, we knew there were some issues with it. We ran out of time. It was in the legislative session. We're basically at the halfway point of our session. It's the end of the year, but the session goes another year after that. We uh, very interested in this issue because I think it's an issue of justice. You've had uh, children that have been molested, uh, victims of sexual abuse, and uh, our own laws shut the time period in which a case can be brought against them. Now, currently under Michigan law, uh, first degree cases, uh, there's no statute of limitation. Uh, the bill that I'm proposing would take uh, extend the statute of limitations for third degree by an additional 10 years. It goes up to age 21 or um, uh, 10 years after the event had happened, whichever is later currently. And then for second degree, which are more serious crimes, it, it joins with first degree and it, it eliminates that statute of limitations. And this came up in a, a number of different uh, circumstances. Uh, one, working with prosecutors and litigators across the state. Uh, two, I've, I've worked with a couple different groups of, of uh, the deal with child psychology uh, and also the National Alliance of Ch for Children, which looks after children welfare issues. Uh, and it's a very horrendous type of crime against a child and it, it scars that they carry through their lifetime. And oftentimes, children and young adults, because it's 21, you know, at that age that they can bring it, they're still at that young age that 
it's very difficult for them to bring a case. Now, the prosecutors have discretion, of course. You, you might be looking at a case, they're still going to be looking at the sufficiency of evidence and the strength of the case. And even under the current statute, a lot of those cases, when they're still within the statute of limitations, don't make it to the courtroom. It's the, the natural progression of what happens in, in a prosecutor's office and, and in a courtroom. But in this case, it doesn't artificially shut the door on justice for children who've been sexually molested and abused. And I feel really strongly about this because it's something that we've seen a lot in both the national news and the local news, certainly statewide, we've seen a number of uh, horrendous instances of this. And uh, I wanna have justice for these kids, for these young adults who are struggling with some issues that scream for justice. As a parent, I can't imagine going through this with one of your children, but how did the idea come about given that sometimes when it comes to law, mm -hmm. statute of limitations, sentencing guidelines, any number of things, those are kind of hard things to move because people get used to the status quo. Yeah, it, very much the case. And it's very much the case that uh, it, we're, we're dealing with some technicalities of the law that may not necessarily jump to a person's attention span when they're looking at it. But um, I, I've, I've had a couple cases that I had been following both nationally and some in the state. and. Uh, kind of piqued my interest. I'd worked on the sex trafficking bills along with the, the primary sponsor and several other colleagues on the, on the committee. And I've been on Judiciary Committee, both in the House and the Senate for almost 13 years. So I deal with a lot of different aspects of criminal law as well as civil law. Uh, and, and as a practicing attorney for, I hate to say it, almost 25 years. Uh, you know, we see a lot of these type of cases out there. And I know a lot of prosecutors. I've worked uh, in the prosecutor's office myself, um, in two different, uh, both the city and the county level. And uh, you see all kinds of different cases that come up. One of the things that you deal with in public life is that people will oftentimes bring up something that happened to them or happened to a family member or even most, most likely uh, something they read about in the news or I read about in the news and uh, kind of piqued my interest and I started looking into it and uh, realizing, yeah, you know, I think we need to do something here. So I reached out to the Prosecutors Association, a number of different attorneys, both defense and the prosecution side, and uh, also the groups that champion the rights of children who'd been molested and hurt. And I don't think there's anything out there that strikes me as uh, more poignant or more um, just gut-wrenchingly wrong thing that somebody takes advantage of a child. And the fact that we had a system that closed the door for justice for those abused children uh, was something that I felt very strongly about and I wanted to be the champion for it and that's why I brought the bill forward. You talked about the sex trafficking laws, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I would say that this legislature has been very proactive. I mean, there's been a lot of work that has been done, um, and there have been any number of members of the Senate and the House who mm -hmm. have really gotten out in the forefront of this. And while this is somewhat different, because this is about a statute of limitations, it could be applicable It as actually well. does fit into it, because the second degree uh, situations do deal with sex trafficking cases, and we're dealing with victims. We're dealing with victims, uh, exploited women, exploited children, even exploited men in, in a lot of cases, that the law is supposed to be on the per side of protecting the innocent, the law is supposed to be on the side of protecting the public, and certainly the law has got to be on the side of protecting children. So just to be clear, this would change the statute of limitations if it has not already expired. You were explaining yeah. that to me earlier. And yeah. <clears throat> this gets kind of in the weeds, but for those of us who aren't attorneys, I mean, this still does offer protections for the accused as well. Oh, it does. It, it does. And, um, and, and there's a, a couple of Supreme Courts that decisions that have kind of defined where the limitations are on this. If the statute of limitations have already run, that means that that statute has been met, um, we're, we'd be barred from changing it. We can't go back. It'd be an ex post facto law. Uh, if the statute is still like with, they're within the statute now, and we just extend it. There's a court ruling that says no, we can we can do that. And that's that's legitimate. But if it's already run, meaning that it's been met, um, we can't change that. So, you know, unfortunately, maybe a case that the statute ran out two or three years ago, we're not going to be able to revive that. But there's a lot of cases out there, potential cases out there that hasn't, and that's what this is going to address. One of the things that I've noticed that is a change in the way that legislatures operate, and it's not just here in the state of Michigan, is they're starting to re-examine 
some of the reaction to a very legitimate outcry from people in the 1980s mm -hmm. that said, if you are going to be convicted of a crime, you are going to do the time for the crime. Mm -hmm. And it was, in some cases, lock them up, throw away the key. In some mm -hmm. cases, it was if you get sentenced to 40, you don't get out in 20. And this happened all over the country. Yes. And now, all these years later, here in the state of Michigan, around the country, people are saying, wait a minute. We got people that we're mad at, people we're afraid of. Who are we going to keep in jail? You have been part of that process here in the Senate and in the House, but you have another set of bills that deals with kind of a narrow yeah. group of individuals. But again, it kind of speaks to how we're looking at dealing with people, particularly nonviolent criminals. We need to continuously examine the laws that we have in the state, and you know, you, you become sort of an expert on a lot of different areas, both civil law, criminal law, probate law, all these different areas. And working with us, um, not only are you exposed to some of the issues that go on in, in the communities and statewide or nationally, uh, but oftentimes you'll run into something that's just, okay, this just doesn't make sense. And oftentimes it comes up in the strangest situ situations or, or, or maybe counterintuitive. Great example, I'm, I've been working on a, a large package of bills that passed the House and Senate last year, another smaller package of bills that's uh, currently in the House and it's going to be up for a hearing, and it deals with um, these three strikes in your outlaw laws. Uh, a number of years ago, we revised those laws. We, we did a lot of nonviolent crimes that they were three strikes and you're out. At the time, most of these people had served at least 10, 12, 15 years in prison. Um, we left out small-time drug offenders that were convicted under this three strikes in your outlaw. And it came up actually in a coffee hour that I had, and a mother of a, of a gentleman who was in the prison system uh, came to speak with me and asked me if I could help get a pardon for her son. And I, I told her flat out, I said, I don't know your son, I, I can't do that, but I, I'll promise you this, I'll look into it and uh, found out he was in Jackson, I said, I'll go and visit him and I'll interview him, and I did. And I went to Jackson, I took a tour of the prison, met the, the warden, talked to the prisoner, struck me as a very uh, good guy, good risk. He was in uh, one of their higher programs. They had a Braille training program, so you don't get that if you're a problem prisoner. And um, so I, I started working on this legislation to, um, to make these individuals who are currently barred from even being considered for parole be considered for parole. Apparently there's only four people in the entire state that are impacted by that. But here's a situation in which you had the wave that you talk about that went nationally. Let's be hard on crime. But I think we also need to be smart on crime. We have to look at people. People do change. Um, we want to make sure that we, we have people prepared to come out of prison so that we don't keep feeding this prison population, cut down in recidivism. We also want to be fair um, and have crimes and punishments that's proportional. And, um, and in this case, I'm working on this package of bills that will allow these people to at least be considered for parole. They don't have to be paroled. They may never be paroled. but they will at least be eligible for parole because we, we have a lot of people in our prison system that probably should be making the room for more dangerous type of offenders rather than keeping people in there that we, we were just mad at them 30 years ago. As I said, there aren't many days left in this legislative session. But as the senator pointed out, the session actually continues into next year, so any bills introduced now can still be acted on in 2018. We'll have a final thought when we come back to the point. So what's next for auto no-fault insurance? Will there actually be reform? Will you ever be able to get insurance companies and caregivers and trial lawyers to all come together and make common sacrifice? Stay tuned. Join us next week to The Point.